Hello, everybody. Welcome on into ClayshareCon. We are starting the afternoon session of day four, and I will be doing a wheel throwing and trimming demo using Studio Pro Bats, Diamond Core Tools trimming tools, and the Speedball Artista wheel. I know the Speedball wheel wasn't advertised as part of the demo, but guess what? You get a bonus. And I'm going to be throwing standing up, so it's a double bonus. Because not only are you getting a wheel you didn't expect to see, I'm going to be standing. Normally I sit at my bailey, but when I use my Artista, I use it here so that I can stand. So that's, that's why I love this. Um, I have to give a huge shout out to Darlene Aspinwell. She gave me this wheel. Like she bought it for herself, used it a bit, decided it wasn't for her. She knew I was looking for one last year. Their wheels are hard to come by and she offered it to me in trade for a few pieces of pottery, which I still have to make for her. So darling, I haven't forgotten. I'm gonna make you your pottery, um, but you'll get something extra special. All right, so the great thing about this wheel is it's tabletop, which means it's portable. Now, if you're getting into pottery and you're thinking this would be a great wheel to invest in, it could be. The thing about it is it's limited. It can only throw up to 25 pounds of clay. It's good if you don't think you're gonna ever throw any more than that. Also, the other thing about it is um, you take it with you, which I love because I can teach workshops and take it with me if I have to. Now, I do have two other pottery wheels, three, three other pottery wheels, no, four, four, no. I have three other, so I have a total of four pottery wheels. One is a kick wheel, and the two others are Bailey Pro XLs, which are really great wheels too. And what I love about this is I can stand up and throw Yes, you can stand up with other wheels, but I don't have them set up for that, and so this one will let me do that. So I'm excited for it. Alrighty, let's go at it. Now, we have got a giveaway today of Diamond Core Tools, one of the reasons why I'm doing this demo, and we have a giveaway of Studio Pro Bats. And we'll be giving away the Studio Pro Bat system, right? It's a Studio Pro Bat, Studio Pro Bat system. I gotta say it twice. Goodness me. Um, and it's this insert system where you have the outer bat and then you have these little squares that insert on the inside. And I like to use them for hand building as well. So it does double duty in my studio. And what I love about it is you can throw smaller things like the, this was thrown on it. And then you just pop it out and put another one in and throw. And you do not need to have a system like this for throwing, but if you're gonna make a lot of very delicate smaller shapes, then this could be great because, yeah, you can cut it off the wheel, lift it up, and set it to the side, but you might distort it. So this means I don't, I haven't touched the pot. Like, there's been no hands on the pot. So it's still perfect, and it can dry till it's ready to be trimmed, which, if this one's ready, we'll trim it, but I got a couple others who are ready. All right, so this has the standard bat pins uh, holes, and the Artista, let me take that little bucket off, has these little bat pins. You do not have to use bat pins if you want to throw just on the wheel head. You take the bat pins off. Uh, if you want to use bats, you should have bat pins. Although, when I first learned to make pottery, we didn't have a wheel that took bat pins. You can have a wheel head drilled so that it will accept them, but we just use a coil of clay, and then you smack your bat down. And I'm sure some of you out there watching are nodding along, going, yep, that's how I had to do it too. So, now, I've got a really great little uh, bat gripper tutorial. This is just a little bit of shelf liner material. It's like a rubberized material. And it's really good because it helps prevent bats from wobbling. Sometimes bats warp and they wobble. It's just part of it, right? Would you bring me comments up, Big? Yep. All right, so I'm getting the, the bat wet. It's dirty. Now, whoever wins the bat systems we're giving away, you don't get a dirty one. You get clean ones. <laughs> but mine's dirty because I use it a lot. And if you remember the Wonder Bat system, this is compatible with the Wonder Bat system, so it works with them if you have them. So you just line up. This is the hardest part of the whole thing is lining up the bat pins correctly on camera, right? Perfect. Thanks for sharing the code for the Diamond Core Tool discount that we have. It's capital DCT Jessica, my name, 22. And all this, the discounts are on claysharecon.com. All right, so we have our, our bat on there. Studio Pro Bat also, they're made in Vermont. Did I mention? 
I didn't mention that. I'm in Vermont. They're in Vermont. It works out really well. It's not me. I don't make the bats, but we just happen to live in the same state. They're about an hour from where I live. So they have a bunch of other bats. This is a round one, which I was just using. That's why it's a wet mess. This one is one of their, like, maybe octagon side. I think it's eight-sided bats. So they've got all kinds of bats over there at Studio Pro Bats. Um, the makers, Todd Walsham, he, his father started making them, and he makes them. He's a potter. His wife is Aisha Peltz. She's a potter. If you don't know them, write these names down. Aisha Peltz, Todd Walsham. Go check out their work. They're amazing potters, and they also make the Studio Pro bat system. All right, so once we got our bat in place, we're ready to go. So the mask underneath is the gripper pad that I just mentioned, and you can make that. Will the pots pop off or do we have to wire them off? I wire them off, they will pop off, but the problem with popping off is they're so dry you can't trim them at that point. So it's better to wire them and trim them yourself. Let's get going. This does have a handheld, a little gear thing, a little control knob, you can turn it on, but I have a pedal which I can control it from the floor, which is very nice. So you control your speed, you turn it on, and then, ooh, I went a little fast. Woo! So you can hear it. Has sound. W wheels should make noise. And uh, I don't know if the mic's picking up. My, my studio is an old carriage house, and the boards are very old, like a couple hundred years old, and it's so squeaky. Got to fix that. So I've already wedged up some clay to be ready for this. Um, I'll do a quick, I, I'll just grab a board. That's not going to work. It's not too big. Grab one of the bats. I'll do a quick wedging tutorial. So you take your clay out of the bag. This is about a pound and a third of clay. I didn't weigh it. I just guessed. What camera are we on? Thanks. That's where I, that's good. So I just took this fresh out of the bag, chopped it up into a little hunk, shaped it into a ball, and then I'm going to wedge. Now, this is too, this is too high to wedge. When you're building a wedging table, you want to think about height. This is too high. Your arms shouldn't go up. You actually want your arms kind of down. You want your wedging table about hip height as well as a work table. So I'm doing what's called spiral wedging. And I'm sorry, I'm shaking the camera like crazy. <laughs> just hang on. It'll be over soon. And so you just keep going and you're wedging and you're making a little spiral. I don't know if the spiral's picking up and you can kind of see how that's happening. And then just smack it down. And I do in my intro to wheel throwing have a tutorial on how to wedge. So when you make coasters, they pop off beautifully and all you have to do is sponge the edge. Exactly. If you do not plan to trim your bottoms, then it's great. But I'm going to put a foot because we're trimming. All right, ready to throw? Uh, the Speedball Artista wheel comes with these two buckets. I have water in one, the other one's empty. I'm going to use the empty one to put, you know, your hand gets clay built up on it. You just scrape your hands down. Now, the, if you want to make wider things on this with a bigger bat, you can. You just need a bat adapter, and that's just a little thing that pops this up higher than the splash pan. Yes, you're now working outside your splash pan, but, you know, those are the things you do when you want to make bigger pieces, right? Oh, Sharon has a great comment. Uh, the Artista was a first wheel, and you can get legs. Yes, you can get legs for it. And my pedal is very responsive. It just instantly starts going. I don't usually uh, throw with the pedal. I actually usually throw with the hand controller. So this is a little uh, new for me. So I'm going to smack it on center. Could you use the strong arm with this? I don't see why you can't. That board's going to make me crazy. All right, let's go ahead and center. And cone up. And then press down. And we're going to cone up again. Now this is really a trimming tutorial. Oh, I'm going to be using I'm going to use this side for the clay. I'm so programmed to use my throwing bucket of water to scrape my hands off on. Let's 
So if you're learning to throw and you're having trouble centering, I suggest you do it blindfolded. I know. Is that crazy? Don't look at the clay. I'm not even looking at the clay right now. I'm talking to Instagram folks. You do not need to look at the clay to center. What you need to do is feel the center happening. You will actually center better if you don't look. So I'm currently using a foot pedal. Uh, my first wheel I had was just an on or off wheel. Um, you can unplug it and control the tabletop. I do have a live tutorial I did a few months back with just the tabletop control. So there's a little bit of a rattle going on, but that's really not going to bother me. So let's go ahead and get our center and then going to open up just a bit. Now we're going to go down and open up all the way. And this is where we decide what are we making? Are we going to make a bowl? I've got two bowls to trim, so I guess we'll stay with bowls. We're just going to pull back and up. We had a great throwing tutorial with Billy Ritter yesterday, um, throwing, throwing big bowls. So if you missed that, go ahead and re-watch the, well, it'll be first time for you, so watch the replay. But if you saw it and you want more pointers, go back and re-watch it. Just setting my bottom. So I'm getting a nice curve since it's going to be a bowl. So you take the splash pan off to use the Griffin uh, get grip. Yes, the Giffen, Giffen grip. That's a mouthful, right? I did see that Giffen grips coming out with a smaller one, a mini Giffen. I always want to call it a Griffin grip. I think they should have named it that. It would have been more interesting. I would rather have a Griffin grip than a Giffen. I'm assuming it's the person who started the company's name, but it's so close to Griffin. Mm -hmm. Just going to pull up gently. I haven't changed the speed since I started pulling up the wall. My foot's actually not even on the pedal. I'm just standing here. So we have a really beautiful curve on the inside. I'm sure the overhead can show you. I'm going to go ahead and use this red ribbon. I'm going to throw down on the inside to just make sure I have the, the curve I want. So this helps. This is a mud tool rib. It's the number three. Did we decide it was the number three? I'll look. I do not remember. I should write it on it with Sharpie. That way I don't mess it up every time I'm like, what number? No, it's the number one. I think I'd remember that. And I've got a little swirl in there because why not? Why not? So I have this beautiful side happening and I'm going to do a little shaping. So I'm going to slow the speed down on just a hair. Oop, let me get it going again. Hold on. Woo! My foot pedal is a little sticky. We had to rebuild this one. I got to get a new one, I think. But So I'm just holding the rib against the side and pressing out with my fingers on the inside. It's actually the side of my fingers. And I'm just pressing it into the rib. But the beautiful thing about this rib is you see how I'm curving it? So the rib is just curved. And so this is the shape of my side right here, this curve. So you can decide what profile you want, curve your rim and just curve your rib and put it up against your bowl. And you just hold your fingers there. Now if you got really fancy and you had a second one, say you have a buy one, get one free or a discount, get two, right? You put one on the inside, one on the outside, press it up against it and uh, you would have smooth inside and out if you don't want throw marks. Hey Linda, your studio is having a potluck today and watching Clay Share Con. Awesome. Fabulous. For those who missed it, I'm throwing on the Speedball Artista wheel. This was a wheel Jeff showed it from GR Pottery Forums yesterday. And the great thing is, you know, I can step away 
So I like the profile of this, but I want to do a little something on the rim. It's just going straight up and ending. So I'm going to do just a little outward flare. Let's get the rim damp. And you can use your finger rolling around, just finger laying on there. Take your inside finger and then just press. Just pressing down against my outside finger. Just like that. And then compress your rim, pinching the side. Resting my finger along the top and it just rolls around. Beautifully, right? So now we have a really nice little profile and if you wanted to change it up even more, you could take this rib. If you felt like your finger wasn't enough of a outward curve, you could, you could still use your fingers or you could just use this red rib and press it against that. And look at how much you can flare this out. So you saw the bowl I carved in the Mishima demo this morning. This is very similar to that bowl. This will be a great cereal bowl, ice cream bowl, any kind of bowl. So there we have it. All right, so I'm going to do a little undercut with my wooden clay knife. That helps guide the wire a little bit. And also, you know, when I go to trim, I've already removed some excess, so it makes it so I don't have to trim quite as much. Then, some people like to have the wheel spinning when they pull the wire through. Some people like to stop it. There's not one way that's better than the other. I'm a, usually a stopper, but you do what you want to do. And then we cut it off. And then you just pull the little uh, bat out. I usually use a flathead screwdriver to do that. And then you just put your next insert in. And I didn't grab my screwdriver. It's over, it's over there. I think it's in the cup with my ruler. Sorry about that, everyone. We're going to get it just a second. So you love this wheel. It's perfect for your space. Yes. So when I, so I use the rib on the inside at the top moving down right to set your curve. You want to do that because if you pull up, it's, it, you know, you, you're pulling up and you'll go out. You get a better curve going down. Oh, I see. <laughs> so you just use this here to pop these out because they are snug and you want them to be snug. They do make a tool called a bat lifter, but just get yourself a flathead screwdriver and you can use that instead. And then you put your next insert in and you're ready to go and you can make the next piece you want to make. So I'm going to pull this off, the whole insert off, sit that to the side. And then we'll put another bat on because we're going to trim now. This is a trimming demo. Do I prefer standing up? It's harder to pull up. I prefer standing up for smaller things. For big things, I still want to sit. I haven't... I, I learn, I've been throwing sitting down for 22 years. It's really hard for me to adjust to standing up overnight. It's definitely something I think can be great for your back. Although throwing sitting down, you know, if you use the right posture, it can work perfectly fine for your whole life. So it's just, you know, doing it in a way that's good for your body. All right, so I'm just cleaning my hands off. And I got the other, got another bat. I'm going to go ahead and trim. I have got a few trimming tools from Diamond Core Tools. So they've been making trimming tools for about two years. And I think I have them all. <laughs> I don't think I have. Maybe I do. So I have given a bunch of these away, but uh, I kept some because they made me some that say clay share, so I felt I can't give away my clay share ones. Plus, I need them for demos. So I have the T1, T2, T3, T4. I'm just going to try to put them in order. T6. Anyhow, there's a T3. See? They say clay share on it. This is my favorite one, the T3. 
and they have these fancy ones that have these cool attachments I mean cool angles and stuff and they all have different backsides to do things where you could press in the clay to add texture or use it to um, carve on wet clay there's lots of things you can do with them so diamond core tool trimming tools are great because they don't ever need sharpening so you will wear the tool out before you have to sharpen it I promise so my go-to is always the t3 but it depends what you want another really good one that I think most people like is the t4 it's just a simple oval like half oval maybe I guess they call it the t2 I like as well I think that's the arc one t1 it's a half dome so like the t T3 that I love so much, the T1's a good one because you get a flat side and a curved side, so it's a multi-use tool. Then they have the star and this tool. I've used them all, and I have a tutorial you can go back and look on Clayshare for diamond core tools, trimming tools, where I use them all, and we did weird stuff with them. <laughs> one day, we played with them all, and it was really fun. So I'm just going to use a few of them, and we're going to trim. And I have got... A bowl. Little little different than the bowl I just made. It's got these throw marks. It's based on a tea bowl design. And what I do when I go to trim, I look inside and I figure out where is my foot ring gonna be. It's gonna be right here. And then I just try to mark it right there. So that means I need to trim there, but how deep are we going? About here. So now I know I need to remove the clay in this section here. So we got that going. I'm just going to get this going so I can put a little con little circle, a few concentric circles. These bats don't have circles marked on them. Most don't. So I want to know approximately where center is before I start. That's the one benefit. I could have just trimmed on the wheel head. They have circles. I don't know why I use the bat. I'm just programmed to trim on bats. I mean, if we just take it all off and even though it has the bat pins on it the pins won't get in the way of my trimming see how we have our circles so then you can just line it up and it does make centering easier because when you're tr centering for trimming because you have to you know start somewhere it's almost perfect so the um, smack centering technique is one I do sometimes. Sometimes I get it perfect right away. Other times I do it and I mess it up. So it's not anything I'm like a proficient at. Oftentimes I will do the old school, take my thumbnail or a tool and I'll let it ro rotate. And you see it's hitting my nail. And I know where it's hitting my nail, I need to push back just a bit. And then you s clean it up where you did that and you do it again until you get it centered. So it's a, my wheel has a fast start. When it wants to go, it's like I'm going. So I think the trick for smacking on center for folks that want to try it is you want to smack it up here. So what happens is when you're off center here, as soon as you see it's off center, smack it. Right? Off center here. Smack it and you'll get it on center. This looks to be centered now. So we're just going to take a few coils of clay. Do I use a sticky bat to trim? Uh, I have one. I hardly ever use it. I find that I have a tendency to sometimes go too fast and even on a sticky bat I send my stuff flying. Yeah, if you've been in the studio with me, you'd know. <laughs> Happens too easy. Um, so I'm just going to use these little wads of clay to hold my bowl in place. Sticky bats are good for wider parts, that wider things like bowls. Cups, it's terrible. You, you'll, knock, you'll knock your piece over while you're trimming. All right, so we know we've got to trim here and here. So let's go ahead and, and give it a go. We're going to talk about something a lot of people have been saying during Clay Share Con, and that is... You know, you always want to be connected to have a strong foundation. And so your hand over here by itself, if it's just floating out, it's going to be loose. 
and it's not going to give you a sturdy base. So you put your hands together, elbows in, and I often just let my fingers ride around on the bottom. Now, Diamond Court Tools makes a trimming spinner. I have one or two of them somewhere. You can also just use a lid to any old thing. This is okay for trimming. It's a little wet. We notice the theme that there's always a perfect consistency for everything in pottery. And I told you the secret to success is timing. And that has to do with the dryness timing, right? And it's true. It's true in everything. So I'm thinking, we're going to turn the, so I'm turning the tool over. I tend to like to trim a bit fast. I'll try to slow it down. So this is the inside ring. That's going to be the inside ring of my foot. And now I made the outside. Now I'm just going to go ahead and trim up the sides. On bowls, I always have a lot more to trim than on a vase or a cup form. That's your problem too, flying pots and sponges. Yeah, uh, I, I do like the sticky bat. If I did a really um, wide bowl, yeah. And I have used it, and I think it's a great product. But for cups in a bowl this size, I wouldn't use it. If you had a Giffen grip, you just pop this in and away you go, right? Giffen grip's not uh, part of Clay Share Con. Not that I wouldn't have them on. We uh, put this together, you know, every year, and there's always so many folks that want to join it. I would love, I always love adding people. So maybe next year. Ran it, we just filled up fast this year with everybody that wanted to demo. So let's try a couple others. That's the, you see how I like the flat side? This is very much like traditional trimming tools they have the flat side here's the t1 so i said i like to go fast no no gotta slow down so this puts a little bit of a curve into the pot and you can turn it around and do it this way Go ahead and actually trim the foot ring. It's a summer tea bowl. I need some summer. Be a while though. So I just went ahead and put in my outside ring. So this is the foot ring right here. Now we have to remove all this. And if you remember, the bottom was pretty thick. For this, I like to use that T3 again. I really want, I love this shape. It's very traditional. So it's always the one I go to. The other one they have that's similar to this one, which is a little wider, is the T8 right here. And what's this one? Let me just see. There was another one, too, I liked. I think it's the T5. Is this it? I don't know where it is. I don't know if I have one. That actually might be the only one I don't have. So here's a funny thing about trimming. When I first started pottery, I hated trimming. I absolutely hated it. I didn't want to trim anything. I thought it was a waste of my time. I would do anything to get out of trimming. I would make pots. I practiced making pots that had bottoms that were just thick enough that you didn't have to trim. But every once in a while, you still get one too thick, and you'd have to trim it. And I'd be like, ugh, I hate trimming. I don't want to do this. It's a waste of my time. I could be making pots. What is that? Trimming is a waste of my time. I could be making pots. Well, trimming is part of making pots. And it can be a very enjoyable part. Actually, now, I really like trimming. It makes you slow down. You get to see the pot again. You get to look at the shape. You get to think about how you made it. You get to think about if you are happy with the shape you made. Maybe next time you do something different. So it gives you another, another chance to spend some time with that pot. Here, let's switch to this one. This is the uh, T8. Let's try the T8. This is another nice one. 
So if you don't want as much of a slant, the T8 is a good one. Let's use that on the side. I want to get rid of some of these trim marks over here. I also think trimming is a chance to refine the piece a little more, you know, to finish it off. I've got this weird little one. This is the T12. It's got this little circle. Looks, it looks like a person, shoulders and their head. It's kind of, oops, slow down, Jess. I'm going to use that. I like to add this decorative element to my feet. It's something I've done. kind of mimics the rims when I put that little uh, rim detail on that I do sometimes. I don't, I don't think I have a bowl with it on. I think the vase has got it. All right, let's clean this up. Do I ever trim a hand-build pot? Uh, rarely. If I hand-build it, what I usually do is hand-build the foot too. Although sometimes I will, sometimes I will throw a cylinder and then I will cut that cylinder into little bits, little rings, and attach those rings to my hand-built pots. So they don't need to be trimmed though, they just get attached. All right, so I'm rounding my edges, no sharp edges on here. Sharp edges now will just mean sharper edges later and then they will scratch stuff. Don't want that. So let's see how we did on our bottom. Move our little lugs. Can you hand build a piece on the wheel and do trimming? You sure can, absolutely. You can trim anything. It's entirely up to you. So this is what I've got for a bottom. So that's it. That's a nice bottom. So now I'll put it upside down because the rim, and, and I didn't talk about that yet, but we can do that now. The rim is pretty dry and you want bowls to have a dryish rim because when you go to trim a bowl and you put the little lugs around it of clay to hold it, it can distort the sides. So you let it be a little dry, but we want the bottom to start drying now a little more than it is. You can see how light it is down here going up. So just sit it upside down on a bat off to the side and then trim your next one. And I got another bowl, a little different shape. This is a very wide, shallow bowl. Everybody's always asking me to throw wide, shallow bowls. So I threw one. I put in a really, really noticeable throw ring. Let's see if you all can see that there. It definitely has that detail. It will show with when it's um, glazed even, it should show through. You find trimming very messy, so you got an artista wheel just so you can take it outside and let the clay, please, clay pieces fly everywhere. That's your, my favorite foot. Yeah, the, uh, that's a foot that, uh, well, let's see, it's on a lot of my pots. It's one of my, it's, it's like, I guess if we get, you know, as you make pots over time, you'll develop styles that will become your signatures and they just are, are part of you and that's, that would definitely be one of mine. All right, where's our foot going to be? It's going to be a little wider because we have a wide bowl, so it's going to be about out here. And then we're going to trim about that much off. And this is all just guessing about how much I'm going to trim. I mean, I might decide after I trim it and then I remove the lugs and I take it off the wheel that I might decide, oh, that's a little, that's a little too thick still. So you put it back on and trim it again. But you, we're just trying to guess so that we can save ourselves time later. Woo, this, this likes to start. There we go. Tap it on center. So my rim is centered down here, but the pot foot is not centered. So that sometimes happens when you're throwing. You'll find the foot isn't centered to the rim. So what do you do? Do you just go with it and you trim your foot to match the rim? Or do you trim your foot to be centered? I like to trim my foot to be centered. Even if it's off centered from the rim. So that's that's one little thing that I do. We'll see how badly I can try to tap it on center. So sometimes I'll, I'll film trimming videos and sometimes I won't even start filming until after I've got the bowl centered 
But sometimes I'll sit there and I'll see, well, can I tap it on center? And once in a while I'll tap it and it'll be perfect. First time out. And then other times, nope. That's going to work there. All right, let's grab our lugs and put them on. And the other thing is it doesn't have to be perfectly centered to trim a foot, just like it doesn't have to be perfectly centered to throw a piece. Yeah, trimming is very relaxing. I think when I was younger and starting out, I was in such a hurry to get the pot trimmed. It was like, okay, got to get this trimmed, got to make another. And that's why we do production bottoms, where we don't trim at all. You just smooth the edges and tap the bottom a bit. Let me get this going a little slower. That's too slow. I could go a little faster than that. Although it's interesting how different your trimming would be if you trim really slow. This is the speed I like to trim at, though. This is a good even speed. So what is this one? This is the T8. I mean, we can go with weird ones. What is this? T10. I mean, it does, if you want a foot to be this height, look at this piece here. If you want that to be the height of your foot, and it works with the shape you're making, you can do this. See how I have a little mark here? This is from when I, when I wired it off. I had my wheel spinning, and you see it did this little bloop. So I'll take care of that when I trim the inside of the foot ring. So this is nice to set the height of the foot. You can get a nice even height all the way around. What else we got? We've got this curved one. This is the uh, T7. It's a curve on one side and a point on the other, on one side. So basically I can't tell you what trimming tool to get. I really can't. I do like that, that T3 and the T8 are nice. Um, this one's really nice too, with that curve. The main thing about diamond core tools is they last and last, and you can get replacement like trimming blades because they don't need sharpening. What will happen is you'll wear through the tool before it sharpens. I have yet to wear through these, any of them. Might eventually, but not yet. Have ever wet the rim and the wheel and attached without lugs? I've done that. Uh, yeah, but again, that comes back to sometimes I still do that, and then the next thing I know, it's flying off the pot, off the wheel. So, but yeah, and sometimes I'll, if you have a big piece that's heavy enough, you don't need to use lugs. It'll hold itself on. Take a little more off here. Let's set the inside foot ring. Now it's a little uneven. The height is. So I'm just going to let this... I've locked my elbows in and I'm just basically trying to hold the tool to get that a little more level than it was. All right, let's go ahead and get the inside. We've got to trim. How are we on time? Five minutes? Am I doing anything other than trimming? I think that's all I'm doing. So I'll finish this up. So if it's too wet, you tend to gouge with a small pressure change. Yeah, there's that timing again. This foot ring is actually, the foot is tiny bit too wet. And that can lead to gouging. It's funny, I'm asked every time I do a demo, how long did I let something set to dry? Or how long do you wait before trimming? And I can tell you what I do, but it won't help you. Because you're going to probably be using a different clay. And you're in a different studio space. And every studio space has different humidity levels. And so that really depends. And also if you have any airflow, you know, a fan or any air blowing on your pieces and how you're drying it. So all those things vary. I can just give you ballpark ideas and figures and numbers, but I can't tell you. Leave it for 
seven five hours and you can trim it. It'd be awesome if we could do that though. Just can't. So those are the little things you'll figure out yourself. All right, let's make that inward curve again. And I really liked how this did it last time, so we're just gonna use it again. So the idea when you're trimming a foot ring is that it looks like a ring that was just set on the bottom, the bottom of a bowl. So if you look at this here, it looks like a little ring we just doop, set on the bottom. And I want to use, where's my, there it is, T3. And I just want to really get in here and define that change where the foot ring begins. Now let's clean it up. I can go over here enjoying it. <laughs> you could just stay, just trim. It's very relaxing. So in my process, often I'll make my pots one day and then the next day I trim. And that's the first thing I do in the studio. I'll come out in the studio, have a cup of tea with me, put on music that I really like to listen to. It's morning, it's early. I'm not really ready for anything loud or rocking. Usually I put on like Lorena McKennett or some kind of classical thing or, you know, other music that just fades into the background. And then I just trim all the pots from the day before and get everything set and ready for the making for that day. Pull these up. Let's check this piece. Sometimes when I'm trimming mugs, I'll be able to use these lugs. I'll wedge them up and use them as handles. Not if I'm trimming like 15 mugs, they dry out too much. But if I'm only trimming like one or two, oh, the weight is perfect. You will know, I remember the first pot I made that after I threw it and then trimmed it and I flipped it over, I flipped it over and I had that moment of, oh, it's perfect. Like the weight is so evenly balanced. When you've trimmed it correctly, you know because sometimes you'll flip it over and be like, oh, it's still a bottom heavy. But this one, it's, it's perfectly even. It's really great when that happens. So now that I've trimmed it, I'm going to go ahead and take a damp sponge and anywhere where there might be marks from any of the process that I don't want there, whether it's the lugs or a fingernail mark because that happens to us all the time, or just a little bit of clay sticking on there. Just wipe it clean. And again, I'll put this upside down. And then... When I flip it over, I'll check it again and make sure that while it was sitting upside down, I didn't sit it on a little like piece of dry clay or the wood didn't have something on it. But that's this bowl. It's kind of almost, if it was taller, it could be considered a bubble bowl shape, you know? But that's a sweet little, sweet little piece. So these two will dry and then uh, turn them over probably in about an hour with the heater running in my studio. And then to clean this up, well, you know, I really hate splash pans. I do. The reason I have a Bailey Pro XL is because it has the single one piece splash pan because I hate cleaning splash pans. But I don't, I don't take the splash pan off this unless it's really bad. And I don't throw too wet, too wet on this one. I really try to be conscious and not use too much water. And the clay is B-Mix that I'm using, yes. So how do you not go through and make a hole in the bottom? So that's how, why I use my fingernail to make that mark, that reference mark, so I know how thick it is. And you will go through. I'm gonna tell you, if you're starting out and you're throwing um, and trimming for the first few times, you are going to go through the bottom. It's gonna happen. The perfect weight is the holy grail. It sure is. So next we have coming up is a really good kiln broadcast. We're going to be talking about how to program offsets, slow cool downs, and firings with Clayscapes Pottery. So they're going to be joining us for that. It's going to be really fun. I'm excited. A lot of people want to know how to do slow cool downs. So I'm just going to continue wiping the wheel, and then I'll set this off to the side, and I'll be back at... 1.30 for that. So come back then and learn about 
setting programming your kiln, setting it for cool downs, slow firings, maybe you have a special firing you want to do, like a crystal glaze firing or something.